When one emoji loves another emoji very, very much, they get together mm. and they create emoji. Hello, everybody. It's your friend, Paul, from Postlight. And I am joined today with lead product designer, Liz Tan, who's been on the podcast before. Liz! Hi! Liz, how you doing? I'm good. I'm very excited Uh, about today. Today is an exciting day because we have someone who is probably the single most influential designer on earth. I would agree to that. That doesn't mean best. <laughs> that doesn't mean doesn't mean anything, but it might be the most influential. And, and you'll realize why I'm burning her after you've listened to her talk for a few minutes. Let's just bring her into the show. This is somebody we have both known for quite a long time. We're going to gently poke at her and make fun, but but also with tremendous respect. Jennifer Daniel, I'm so glad you're on our podcast. Paul Ford, Liz Tan, happy to be here. Full disclosures, right? Like I overlapped with you at, at Bloomberg Business Week. We got to know each other a little bit. Liz, you've known Jennifer for a while too, right? I have. Not really sure we can really talk about it. I don't know, if Jen, if you're comfortable, but I know you from like when you made a Harry Potter magazine out of Urban Outfitters uh, catalog. That's how long ago I've known you. <laughs> you missed the Victoria's Secret version. Oh, that we- one was really spicy. <laughs> I know. This is why... So. Jen, what is your title and what is your, what do you do? You work at Google, which is a little company. We should tell people Google is a a search engine and advertising firm. But what, what do you do? I work at an ad-based company called google.com. And what do I do? I make emoji. I make a lot of emoji. I do other things as well. But like, who wants to actually hear about all the things that a nurse does? You like... You're like, you're a nurse. I get it. I get what you do. I don't need all the whole rigmarole. But yeah, I make a lot of things at Google and one of them is emoji. What's it? So you're, I think of you as emoji czar. Is that like a fair, to, fair title? I'm more formally the chair of the emoji subcommittee for the Unicode Consortium. Damn, that is it's, a good title. It sounds is, pretty. Wow. It's a big mouthful. It doesn't sound nearly as fancy as CEO of Postlight, but you know. I don't think I have ever been, and I'm not kidding, as jealous of another <laughs> human being, because that is like everything I love, like standards bodies, little, and you also have design, you have talent that, that I completely lack. All right, wait, wait, wait. I think that, you know, then then we're going to flip the other way. It's like, oh, you design emoji, but what what do you actually, what do you do? What do you do all day? I, it's, you know, it really isn't too dissimilar from like any other job that requires video chat. You know, it's just, it's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of Google Doc making. It's a lot of jiggling my mouse. It's a lot of... I really believe deeply in my heart, and by the end of this podcast, I will have convinced you both, that there needs to be a cough drop emoji. First of all, What does that even mean? Second of all, what would have to happen? Well, what if I told you it already existed? You're only limited by your own imagination, Paul. Think. Dig deep. So the thing about emoji is that people don't go around thinking, I need to add a new letter to the alphabet. Like, what's a new letter I can add to the alphabet? What they do instead is they play with words and jargon and slang, and they create new words and new phrases, but they don't think to themselves, like, what's a new letter so that I can convey this range of concepts? Okay, 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 so no new letters in the alphabet. Okay, but I still, all right, so what now? Meeting's over? (laughs) Yeah, everyone go home. Time to pour yourself a, a drink. It's more like, what can you do with the resources available to you, just like anything else. Like when you're talking to someone, do you use body language, eye contact, volume, cadence of speech? And online, what do you do? Do you use like the reaction bar? Do you use words or letters or pictures or memes or I don't know, animated images? The audience can't see this, but Jen just became so incredibly animated as she was telling us that like her entire, all her hand, everything started moving at once. It was awesome. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think like with cough drop, if you really wanted to convey the specificity that comes with a cough drop, mm-hmm. you can use a number of existing ones, right? You can use, there's an emoji that is just a very nondescript, it looks just like a cough drop, uh, but I think it's called candy. But it looks like it's like basically a circle that's re- in a little wrapping, something you might see at your grandma's house, right? Mm-hmm. Like in a, in a mm-hmm. jar. Mm-hmm. So you could use that next to the emoji where it has someone with a little tissue where it yeah. looks like they're sick. And if you want to convey that 
you that, that's it that's probably sufficient because 85 percent of emoji are shared with words to clarify oh, their intent interesting. So like, okay people don't use emoji like a language in fact if emoji were a language no one would use it it's very hard to learn a new language right. like, like i would love to learn a new language i've tried to I'm terrible at learning new languages, but so it's purely what makes emoji, supplemental. It's, it's it is okay. It, 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 the reason it's successful is because it works with how you already talk and behave. So it's like punctuation. It's like a little zhuzh. All right, so now you bum me out. I'm sitting here. I'm holding a, hot, a, a cough drop like a chump. But okay, but you're saying like, all right, all right, no, calm down, buddy. You don't need it. You don't, but but certainly some new emoji get in. Well, don't be too bummed. I mean, like, you wanted to convey the concept of cough drop, and here you are. You can, and you don't have to wait. Unless you're just bummed that you didn't get to say you made it, which is a more about an ego thing than about communication. No, that's right. I'm a trivial person, and I, I want to <laughs> go to the standards body and convince them that I matter. Well, first, you could become a member. Like, Unicode is, like, super mm. cheap. You could become a member and attend, you know, not emoji meetings, but, like, standards bodies meetings if you are as impassioned about it as you insist you are. Watch out, Unicode. Yeah. All right, Come wait on, a minute, board, wait a minute. What are standard? Okay, what's a standards body? Because our audience has no idea if they're anything like most people. And what are standards bodies meetings like? I love going to the Unicode meetings. Uh, they happen four times a year. They used to be in person. Uh, but due to obvious world events, we have been doing them digitally for over a year now. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, like you could think of standards just like anything else. Like they just, they're just guidelines. They're like general principles and rules that, you know, you should probably listen to mm -hmm. if you're going to be using it. You know, they're not the police, you know, they're not re they're not enforcing it. They're just sort of like, you should probably do this. This is what we recommend for these number of reasons. But they don't go around saying, you didn't follow our guidelines, no soup for you, mm -hmm. right? They just like, you're like, it's, that's on you. And that they're open standards and anyone can contribute. And it's a volunteer-based organization. And everyone does it because they really care about communicating online, right? Before Unicode, you couldn't send things in your native tongue digitally to another computer, like if, you're, if you spoke Hindi, for example, because it wouldn't render. It's not just emoji. Like Uni no. emoji are added on to Unicode or part of Unicode, but like Unicode is a standard for all the world's languages. That's right. So they they're encoding all the world's languages. So like before they came around, if you wanted to send a message in Hindi from one device, and you wanted the person you're sending it to to also read it in Hindi, before Unicode that was a real problem. So like every letter that you read on a screen is assigned a code point, right? Okay. The letter A, it's code point. U O O four one. So when you wow. send, that's what I like a. to see. That's <laughs> great. That's going to be on the whiteboard interview. That's wonderful. All right. So, okay. So that so there's a special code point. So inside the computer in the memory is like boop 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 boop, and that that it knows that's an A, and now everybody's computer knows that's an A because they all agreed to talk Unicode. That's right. When you send the letter A to someone, there's that reasonable expectation they will also see the letter A because you're all basing it on the same. Database, basically. And this works for all letters. Like in Hebrew, you know, Aleph, the code point is U-O-5-D-0. And for emoji, that's true too. So each emoji is assigned a code point. So face palm is U-1-F-9-2-6. I cannot do that for all emoji. It's still, I just still it pretty good though. I will say, having gone to the Unicode Consortium website, I, not that I don't visit it every single week, but like membership is usually very expensive and prohibitive in organizations like this. Here, it's like 75 bucks. Like good, good for them. They actually want the world to join this thing. They really do care about making language accessible online. It's what they do. It's the, it's the foundation of, of why people continue to, to support Unicode. So how does, like, how does avocado become avocado? Help us understand. I think avocado, I don't know if it was one of the original emoji, but it's definitely one of the old school emoji. So there's a, a great deal of emoji that are on your keyboard just because they originated from J Japanese phone carriers. So they're on there. You're like, why is... Love Hotel. Why is Love Hotel on my keyboard? Surely if Love Hotel's on my keyboard, I should be able to get neck massager. But actually a great deal of them just come from the legacy of where emoji originated. So they're very culturally specific and on, on, honestly, uh, like of that era, like specifically of the 90s, like they originate from the 90s. Then Unicode came in. Basically, they were very popular in Japan. And 
folks in the West were like, how can we also be popular in Japan? And Unicode had started about 30 years ago. So I think they were relatively, they'd been around for a while, actually. And they were able to say, like, this is actually something we can help with. Because on Japanese phone carriers, if you were sending one bitmapped image to another one, you were having that problem where it wasn't rendering because you were on Docomo and they were on SoftBank, for example. So Unicode said, we can help with that. We can standardize it in some way, and that'll make it easier. So they did that. Then more folks started doing it. Then you started seeing emoji in Gmail, right? You started seeing all these little uh, cute little animated characters in there. It's pre-Unicode, but they were like proto-emoji, like a dancing lobster and like a bouncing person hugging. And iOS was interested in it as well, of course. Uh, so they started implementing emoji into their keyboard. And thanks to Unicode, they've, they've become more standard so that when you send something in one, on one device, it renders on another device. And, and here we are now with avocado emoji. All right. So, so giant organizations not quite working together, but agreeing to support the standard. I wasn't around, but I do believe there was a great deal of collaboration required because this, is gonna, this was a pretty intense and radical idea because Unicode had pre already existed for regular languages. What we were suggesting is that this was going to be visual. And that's a pretty big step from what they were doing previously. So yeah, there is, there is, a, there is collaboration, <laughs> at least now in my era, back now in the newfangled days of emoji. It's nice. It's nice that giants are getting along. I mean, what, what's the most recent emoji that pops to mind? I mean, I'm working on the new emoji for next year, huh. so I'm only, that's huh. part of, uh, that's, so you're way in the past, I Paul. I can't really talk about Are you allowed to talk like, about the new emoji? 2021 emoji. Oh, for sure. The short list was published in okay. January. There's about 36 of them. I think if you Google like alpha emoji candidates, Unicode. Doing it. I'm Googling. You might Googling. Get them, I'm definitely, see if I'm that not, works. not using Bing in this context. So yeah, so we've been working on x-ray emoji. We've been mm. working on... Oh, we got troll. Troll's coming. Troll is coming. Uh, so these are all the emoji that'll be in the next batch. How does this get decided on? How, how do you decide what comes next? Okay, so we talked a little bit about Unicode. So it's a big group and they have lots of different subcommittees. Some focus on scripting, some focus on, on specific languages. The committee that, that I chair is about, obviously, emoji. And every year we get together and establish priorities for what we want to be focusing on that year. Otherwise, we'd be a bunch of feral cats that are just randomly encoding things. So about two years ago, we, oh no, one year, just a year ago, sorry, it's been a long year, uh, we converged on the idea of reducing the number of emoji we encode and to identify more globally relevant emoji. And there's like two ways to interpret what globally relevant means. You know, one is to say, what is globally relevant? It's something that means something to everybody in the world, right? Another way to say globally relevant is it is relevant to just a very specific group of people in the world, thereby making it globally relevant because it's relevant to that, you know, very specific region. We're, we're talking more about the the former in this case. We want concepts that are broad and relevant so that when people look in their keyboard, they don't think to themselves, what is that? I don't know what that is. You want them to be like, I know how to use that. And it doesn't matter if they're wrong because no one's wrong with emoji, right? So like mate, which became an emoji, I wanna say in 2019, is a very popular drink in Argentina and Uruguay. But you know, there's like lots of different versions of mate. There's hot mate and cold mate. You know, to someone who is not from that part of the world, they look at it and they just see a coconut drink. They're just like, oh, it's a coconut drink. I, I, I know what a coconut drink is. Like I've seen those in cartoons and I've seen them in the movie. Like I know like it means like vacation or like drinking on a tropical island. And so while mate means something very specific to somewhere else in the world, it has still has global relevance. And that's something that's super important. So those are the sort of the priorities. So as we establish those, everyone's on board for it, we then try to figure out how to execute it. One way we do that is we provide guidelines and lists for people interested in writing proposals. So if you are interested in hand gestures, Lauren Gaughan, who's a linguist who specializes in gesture, wrote, I think it's just a two-page document about what to consider when writing a hand gesture. Like these are the things that work, these are the things that are less successful, and then wrote an additional document that gave a list of possible candidates that would be worth considering for future emoji. Uh, we do that with a couple categories. I did one for smileys. So then we, we create these lists for people to consider and then we review them. So we spend a lot of time reviewing. I will say that we, we're changing the process a bit, which we'll, we, we, we normally or historically 
have accepted proposals all year round, but that is deeply suffocating uh, and distracting because we can't actually get any work done because we're just reviewing proposals. So we're, we're only reviewing proposal, proposals basically in the summer. And in that summer, we review them. We, we also return them for modifications. We think there's potential. We're like, oh, this one could work, but like it really doesn't have enough evidence of multiple uses, right? It's just literally representing neck massager <laughs> what are other ways that people are using neck massager in conversations right like oh, what are right. other like more metaphor yeah so look one of the things i like to do is look at standards i enjoy it i i look at the standard for the lotus emoji which is one of the upcoming emojis for version 14.0 and nice emoji looks good interestingly enough it was submitted by jennifer daniel in September 2019, so we're we're still not it's still not ratified, right? It's still not officially part of the new emoji, but we're we're definitely going on a year plus here. What am I looking at? I am looking at an enormous amount of data. We're going to link this in the show notes, but I'm looking at all sorts of things about the the Lotus. Talk me through this document. Who's reading this? What am I supposed to be learning here when I am standardizing the Lotus? Well, that's true. It takes about over two years to encode an emoji. Although because of COVID, the Unicode process was delayed six more months. So while this was on track to become an emoji earlier, it is it has been delayed. But yeah, I think the, the structure of this proposal is probably a good example of how we review or how pr- proposals are reviewed or evaluated. Okay, so who drew the, who drew the Lotus? Like that, that's always what I think. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here with Liz and I'm just like, designers are, are busy people. You gotta go get one and get them to do things. I can't draw a lotus. I mean, I can't either, but I drew this one. I mean, like, <laughs> oh, it's a good lotus. Liz, do you want to critique it? Not really. Yeah. Not with the artist. Not with the artist in here. My goodness. It's not Pressure. good. We'll do it. There's all kinds we'll do of it after the it. show. Yeah. We'll, 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 Let's we'll do it really, outro. Like, it, there's a lot. Like, but the, the point is that you get that it's a lotus. Like, it does the job sufficiently where it doesn't have an opinion. It's on a lily pad. It's on a lily pad, which we did remove later down mm. in the process after many conversations with botanists. But in the original proposal, it did have a lily pad. See, you say that like that's normal. Liz, when's the last time you called a botanist because of the work you were doing? Never. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you realize, as you're talking to us, the amount of surreal things, right? Like, it's just like, oh, yeah, well, we had to call a botanist because, you know, the lotus has global significance and over 8 billion cultures are going to be... <laughs> interacting with this emoji like it's wild because it's a it's like five pixels but it's so enormous and yet we don't have giant launch events when these come out do we like there's no no do no. they just roll out on your phone they like got a lotus now it's i mean like if you had told me i'd be working on emoji i probably would have said what are emoji but i also would have been like i have no idea what you're talking about it just was not in my like thought process of, of career development but as I do it, I'm realizing that it's probably the closest to journalism in the tech world that I could probably get to, right? Because I am trying to figure out, I just, I'm looking at how people are already behaving, trying to understand it more, talk to them, get a deeper understanding of it, and then talk to experts about it to make sure that I am understanding it right, and then figure out where that overlap is. And that's that's really a lot of the emoji work is like a journalist surrounding yourself by people who know more than you and putting it out in the world. But you're also you're also designing these, right? Like as a designer, um, as Paul has pointed out helpfully, I'm thinking about like how many <laughs> versions of this lotus flower you drew, like how many versions, you know, with or without the lily pad, how many petals you chose to put in here, the gradients are in here. I mean, those are decisions that you're also making along with the research. Yep. There's there's more than one lotus drawing that happens. Can't just do the first one. Or can you? <laughs> No one would expect the first draft. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I'm projecting onto you, right, as we were, as we were talking. And, and you, in the last minute or two, you showed me that I was totally wrong about something. Because what I was thinking was, because I, I knew you before, right? But I always thought of you as like a designer's designer, like really, really just like moving forward, very editorial focus and so on. And I assumed that the hard part, the part that would be take the most focus would be the like wrapping your head around the technical googly parts of this but you actually really threw me a curveball there which is no that's like you got that it's all good you go you'd look at the unicode standard it's bytecodes fine 
that's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out the entire world's culture like a journalist and then translating that into design, which now that I've said it back to you, I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. Tell us the story of how you landed in this position, because this is an unusual position. It's the same story of like how I worked in the news in the in news. You know, I was someone's assistant for a number of years and then they adopt. They were like, hey, I got a job at the time. So you be my assistant. And I was like, yep, on my way. And Worked there for a bit, and someone was like, you know how to use a computer? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, mm, oh, cool. Maybe you can make some charts. And I was like, I can. I know how to use Excel. Yeah, sure, we can do that. And then they're like, oh, you know how to draw. Can you draw me this? And I was like, sure, I could draw a peacock running away from its feathers. Yeah, sure, I could do that too. And just being in the place, just showing up, just showed up to there. And Yeah, and also being able to draw a peacock running away from its feathers. <laughs> And it, well, Google's no different. You know, it's an engineering driven company, but you figure out what's important to other people and then you figure out how to navigate that space. You be what you need to be. And also you kind of got to teach people along the way how to like think beyond their current worldview. But emoji are this amazing thing that I know you've mentioned a couple of times that I work for Google.com, but, yeah. but uh, Google doesn't own emoji. You know, no one owns emoji. Unicode doesn't even own emoji. They, <laughs> it just, they just create the plumbing. They just create the plumbing so it can be distributed on different platforms. And that's what is really great about, about it is that no one can claim it as their own. Everyone can say what it is, what they want it to be, how they use it. And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something, man, because it's just not true. That's just marketing. So I think my connection to it was fairly organic. And I was just drawn to it because of circumstance. I was working on one of Google's many messaging experiences and, you know, figuring out how people communicated on diff on it differently in, in different parts of the world. And that's so interesting. You know, that's just that that's always been interesting to me as a journalist, former journalist, I suppose, and, and what I do now. And yeah, I call people from the Monterey Bay Aquarium to talk to them about our marine animals, or I talk to a cardiovascular surgeon about the x-ray emoji or an anatomical heart. And I do that because I have a history of already doing that. So I'm like building on I probably wouldn't have done that if I didn't work in journalism. That is actually, I mean, usually when a journalist calls you, it's it's really bad. Sometimes good, but often really bad. But I bet people are highly motivated and excited. It's interesting because when you talk to these people, the, the generosity of people offering their expertise to journalists and offering their expertise to Unicode is that they're doing it freely. Right? They're not charging right. for it. They're, they're, they're doing it, you know, whether they're an academic or a biologist at a zoo and so when I look to find additional experts, I start, I start to find people who I'm like, oh, wow, I wish they were more part of our process rather than just, you know, just consulting on lung emoji, lungs, plural. Maybe they would be involved more in our process, but people don't have time for the amount of work that goes into it. And so you really do have to go outside of the expertise of Unicode and, and, and talk to people. Well, this is like our industry in general, which I mean, at this, I'm talking about the tech industry. At its absolute best, when you talk to technologists, they're translating one domain into software, right? Like, I mean, that is a lot of work. And if you get doctors like to complain, I mean, they love to complain. Every time I see my GP, he's like, this software. <laughs> just, but, you know, he's not going to go back to school and, and learn good UX practices. Like, that's not what he's going to do. He's going to yell at me about my cholesterol. And, like, so, I mean, I think that the, the function – the standards body provides, right, is that when it does come time, it would be interesting to see a bunch of med students be like, I wish I had this emoji, except it might also be terrible. When you see how those people communicate, it's grisly stuff, just absolutely grisly. And maybe we don't need all that in our emoji that our children use right now. Because med, med students would just be like, x-ray, you should show lung with blood. What's interesting about that is all how you frame it, right? Think about like even when you talk to clients, like, you do, like how you frame it will directly relate to the kind of feedback you get. So I don't ask people, how accurate is this anatomical heart? Well, I do ask that. But in addition to that, I also ask, what are the features of an anatomical heart that make it in an anatomical heart? What is emblematic of it? Is it all the aortic valves? Is it like the positioning? Is it the angle? Like, you know, because those are things the doctor's talking about. Like, he's like, well, when I'm doing surgery, I see it from this angle. But when people are looking at you, you see the heart from this angle. And like, so which one do you want? Do you want fourth, per, you know, you're breaking the fourth wall here? Or are you, are you doing surgery? And so 
they're thinking about it through their worldview. And your job is to kind of filter that and try to think, okay, well, how will this be used in a communicative context? How will this render in a small size? And then you take away the details that are unnecessary. And generally, the, the emoji that, that we publish, uh, that, that Google creates for Noto emoji, are not realistic, right? They attempt to be authentic, but they're not trying to reproduce reality because like our cameras are pretty good now. Like you need a, you need a picture, like you can you can get that. But the yeah, beauty I don't of illustration really want like a a yeah, glistening no, red heart every time I want to tell my wife I, I love it. Well, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of, the, you know, the emblematic, symbolic red heart as well. But, like, right. you also, you don't want something from your biology class where it has, like, all the chambers in it. You could take it apart. You want something that just gives you a sense of, well, anatomical heart's interesting because it is more realistic than the abstract heart that we've come to, to use to mean love. But the beauty of illustration is that it can deviate from reality. Right. It, it, it has it allowed it's more forgiving and softer and can be cuter. <laughs> and those are the kinds of things that we try to lean into. That you just described the role of a designer. Uh, I know you lean pretty hard on journalism, but asking the doctor to describe the different views and then you interpreting that and simplifying that to me sounds like, you know, you're still you're still a designer, Jen. You're still a designer. <laughs> We've talked about this, I think, Liz, like sometimes the approach is design but you execute like an illustrator or maybe you ex execute like a PM, you know, or, you know, like you just, the titles are useful for certain conversations and then the verbs, you know, how you actually make the work can, can yeah. be different. Is there, is there competition between the major vendors? Like, do you think to yourself, I wonder what Samsung's going to do after you drop that Lotus <laughs> in the conversation? I think in the past there has been, this weird thing where Unicode published their standard, you know, here's our list of draft candidates, be fruitful and multiply. And they just kind of like threw it over a fence. So you catches it and everyone finds out in nine months. But yeah. a lot of what I've been trying to do since I became chair and before I was chair was go, hey, have you talked to anyone at Samsung? <laughs> Hey, do you know anyone at Microsoft? This is the great mystery of consulting. I have this over and over in my life. I'm like, hey, have you ever gone over the hall there? Just said anything? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. The process. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So if you get people in a room. Some folks are interested in emoji for different reasons than others. So I try to get the people who care about it for the same reasons in certain conversations and for different reasons in other conversations so there can be like meaningful progress. So, you know, I do talk with folks at all these different companies and to varying levels of detail. Some folks don't need it, right? And it's like, what? I don't like to waste my time with them because they have it under control. And other folks maybe don't and they, they want to. Their, maybe their release schedule is nine months ahead of everyone else. So they can't wait to see what everyone else does. They have to do it earlier. So just getting people in a room or a virtual room to talk and share and get them involved in the process of evaluation as well so that by the time Unicode's already approved an emoji, it's kind of too late to have those conversations because at that point, you already have to do it. There's already a code point assigned to it. I feel like um, we should at least let the listeners know a little bit about, you know, what happened to blobs, even if they are before your time, just to just so people know to get off your your back about it. We can have a brief moment of silence for our blobs. Yeah, Jen. Yeah. God, those blobs were good. Were that really wasn't good. you. You didn't kill the blobs. I didn't kill the blobs. We are bringing back a lot of what made blobs cute and un uncomplicated back into Noto Emoji. I mean, all the animals are back. We got the cute turtle. We got the cute bird. We got a cute. I've been bee. noted. People should follow Jennifer on on Twitter, <laughs> where she has been publishing turtle variations. Yes, yes, on a daily basis. Uh, that's Emoji Kitchen. So that is an interesting evolution of emoji that maybe is out of scope for this conversation. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Pitch it. What's Emoji Kitchen? Oh, Emoji Kitchen is a real fun little feature. Uh, so if you're on Android. Android only friends. I am, thank God, one thing for me. <laughs> one thing on my Pixel. Here we go. Oh, Here yeah, go. baby. All right, let's go through. All right, I'm going to go get Emoji Kitchen. It, no, you don't have to get it, it. It's on your phone, my friend. Oh, it's on my phone? It's oh, my God. Oh, my God. You don't have to. You just open your keyboard. How do I get to Emoji Kitchen? Well, well, what app are you in right now? Twitter. Okay, so just click on the Emoji button, and you see all your, your friendly Emoji. I'm in there. Recently used includes syringe because I got a vaccine oh, okay. and the turtle. I've been using the turtle. Okay, click the turtle. Click on the turtle. What happens? 
Yeah. I get all these options for the turtle. I never said there's a monkey turtle, a sad turtle, a ghost, a turtle on a ghost's head. How did that happen? Hit any other emoji. And uh, it will combine pumpkin. them. Pumpkin. <gasps> turtle pumpkin. There you go, bud. How yeah. the hell did you do it? You How'd you do it? How did you make turtle pumpkin? Send these to Liz Tan because she can't until she comes on yeah. over. I'm on the other side. I'm on the. I'm in the dark side. You're, okay, so not everything combines. No, we, there's about fifteen thousand combinations. So you know. Can I make a suggestion? <laughs> I'll bring it. Start adding syringes to things so we can communicate vaccine emotions. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Slow turtle vaccine is one of the things. Pumpkin vaccines. Maybe I guess that's why I don't work at Google. No, no, anyway, I, syringe oh, wow. is on the list, actually. Um, but you could also hit microbe, and you get a bunch of microbe variants. Or the uh, mask. You can combine the mask with just about anything. Uh, damn, well. that's cool. So you have to do this manually, though. You've had to make 15,000 combos? Yeah. So <laughs> this machine learning needs to get in there. Come yeah. on. Now, who wants machine learning when you have five fingers <laughs> to do it? Last thing. Young people on the internet are saying that emo certain emojis aren't cool anymore. So what are we going to do? Are we just too, are, are emojis going to be something that they associate with old millennials? Possibly. I mean, the fact that emoji are still relevant today is a total, it's totally tubular. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, frankly, I don't want you to answer that question any more than that. That is. It's perfect. <laughs> it is, yeah. Thank you. This has been rad. I mean, the thing about <laughs> the internet right now is I do feel like there's this weird thing happening where, like, lockdown boredom is making the over 30 crowd act more like teenagers, and they're playing these weird games online about status because there's a lack yeah. of being able to do it. There's no socialization opportunities uh, outside of the internet, and so... That's why you see millennials like reacting to Gen Zs and the straight pants and the flared pants. And like, you're going to always have like people saying what's old is new and it's old, you know, it's like a whole cycle. But the emoji are no different. I think they've remained relevant for a really long time, but how we use them is rapidly changed, rapidly changed. Like, like they're not for text messaging exclusively anymore. And that's awesome. But don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't let anyone tell you how to use an emoji. I'll use emoji however I want. <laughs> well, I'm going to use emoji till I die. Let's be clear. And it's very exciting in, in a way that maybe, maybe this is just me being nerdy, but the two things for me are that how much of the work that goes into these is cultural, not technological. To Liz's point earlier, like design is a kind of research and journalism. And the other is that like, just that, that a good standards body linking things together has an enormous cultural authority. And that's kind of cool that because Apple, Google, Samsung, everybody else, like they're not motivated necessarily to get along, but we do need our new big alphabet, which includes pumpkins. We need more pumpkins. Well, you know, it's funny. I think that people really think of big tech in this context as sort of this like arbiter, this like accidental arbiter of how we communicate. But like, again, it, they're just the, the distribution of what we're already doing. I, I, I do believe that to be true. I think they're really, it's a really easy headline in general. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, Google and Apple add salute face emoji. So for to support our troops. And it's like, no, no, we didn't add it to support our troops. We added it to like have a soft way of acknowledging when someone messages you something and you want to just say, yes, I got it. Like, it's actually quite chill. Like, we're chill here, guys. Like, we've been saluting for a really long time. We will continue to support our troops. We will also use it to support our troops, but, like, that's not... I mean, that's the thing. That's the reality. That's the way language works, yeah. right? Like, people are going to use it to, salute the, to support the troops. Others are going to use it ironically. Yep. Others are going to have... But... The, the thing you're saying that I, I think is, is critical here, right, is that a truly open-ended $75 membership standards body came to believe that the salute is a signal part of human communication and has been for a long time, and it should be represented in this big visual grammar. That That's what actually happened here, and then then a whole lot of things follow on from that. And so there's all kinds of interpretations of that because it's language. It's fluid. It's unstoppable. All right, well, Liz, we got to go. There's over 500 million things that we probably could be talking about here. There are so many things, so many questions still. But <sighs> but Jennifer Daniel, if people want to get in touch with you, 
Assuming you want that. Uh, they can, well, the emoji font that I work on is open source. So if you're interested in uh, using it, it is available it's on GitHub and you can uh, freely use it. It's called Noto Emoji. Emoji Kitchen is a feature that is near and dear to my heart and it's available on Gboard uh, for those who are on Android devices and it combines any emoji, well, most emoji, many emoji, <laughs> With many other emoji. Certainly puts a turtle and a jack o' lantern. Yeah, together. it's a very Real cute, nice. really cute turtle lantern. And I'm on TikTok. I'm on the Twitter. But yeah, I'm on all the medias. I'm an old lady, so you can find me on Instagram. Well, that is that is good. Everyone should follow Jennifer Daniel, and you should look through Noto emoji because there is a lot going on. There's a lot of wow. This world is vast and extremely. Cute. All right, Liz. Did that oh. did that answer all your questions? Yeah, I think uh, I think I'm all set. I think I don't need to talk to Jen for at least another like pandemic or something. <laughs> Feels like Jen. You know, she seems like you know, just she's real smart. <laughs> she's just real smart. <laughs> it's always fun. All right, well, good. Well, Liz, I don't know if you know this, but if people need to get in touch with Postlight, they can just email hello at postlight.com. That's all they need to know. That's right. And we're on all the social channels. If you want to do the tweeting the instagramming we're we're around everybody knows get in touch and uh we love you that's all that's all you need to know we love you and uh we run we want to help you and lots of people get in touch even if they're not sure how we can help like little nonprofits, all sorts of stuff we always try to answer and be helpful so you go ahead and get in touch we're feeling very generous because i just looked at nine million pictures of hearts while we were doing this interview as i was <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hearts a lot of hearts all right let's get out of here <laughs>